Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Art Gallery of New South Wales and to Art After Hours. I'm sorry we're running a little bit late, but with a renowned artist like Tracy Emin, if you didn't make a rock star entry, who can do it? So please join me in welcoming Tracy. Now, I'm Wayne Tunnicliffe, Head Curator of Australian Art here at the Gallery, and I will begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, on whose land we gather, and their elders past and present. Also, this event is being filmed for broadcast, so if you're here on a date with someone you shouldn't be, now's <laughs> the time to go. Tracy, it's such a pleasure to have you here. And of course, you've not come over from London just to see us. So you're actually here for a very special project, which was launched today, The Distance of Your Heart, a new City of Sydney public art commission. Uh, and it's a spectacular work in the most gentle, she gentle and generous way. It's unmonumental, but it gives so much. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what that work is? Um, well... Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for coming and I'm really sorry that I'm late, but after today, the unveiling of the birds, I went home and I went to sleep and I woke up at about six o'clock, so I'm very, very sorry, but I'm here, so that's what's important. So Wayne, when I first met Wayne 15 years ago, over 15 years ago, he, he and Natasha Bullock, who's now at the um, MCA, met me off the plane and they were very excited. And the first thing they said to me is, where's Matt? And Matt Collishaw was my boyfriend at the time, as they thought. But Matt, about two, a week or so before, had decided that it was over between us. So my, our planned trip to go to, like, have this wonderful romantic holiday in Thailand and then come to Australia together was actually a bit of a disaster. And the first, pl and my hotel, I was staying at the W Hotel, which is down at, you know, now the Blue Hotel, whatever it's called at Willamaloo. Mm -hmm. And it, my room wasn't ready to 11. So they decided to take me on a bit of a, like, kind of little oh. tourist site. And the first place you took me was, where is it? I, we went, we actually, well, we, we thought we'd start with a very scenic view for Tracy. So we have to say, we welcomed her, we said, where's Matt? She burst into tears. <laughs> that wasn't the best start for meeting one of the most prominent artists in the world and welcoming to Sydney. So that's, welcome, Tracy. Sob. I thought, okay, well, let's go and look at some sights. So we actually took her out. We thought we'd start as far, right out near the ocean with that spectacular view. So we took someone who's feeling quite vulnerable straight to the gap. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, brilliant. <laughs> Why have you brought me here? <laughs> and so it went on, okay? I can tell you what the next day was with Wayne, where I nearly got, like, drowned, eaten by sharks, sunk in a boat, God knows whatever, in, in where was it, with Rose Bay, was it? We did go to Rose yeah, Bay. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> hit the swale. <laughs> I was with a group of people, young people, and we were in a tiny rowing boat, and all they cared about was the slabs of beer. And they had a decision, should we show, throw the person off or the slabs of beer? This was not a joke, as we hit the swale or whatever. My first moment of coming to Australia was full of the most amazing sense of humour and lovely, warm, welcoming people who actually were quite hardcore and very receptive to emotion. Like, you get off a plane and you start crying and people take you to a suicide jump. It's kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're really funny. They get it, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, anyway, so my first experience coming to Australia... My boyfriend at the time... At, not my boyfriend, but he, you know, Matt said he wanted... He said he wanted some space. He wanted some distance. And I thought, yeah, Australia is kind of quite a long way from London. Yeah. <laughs> so when I was here, I was kind of doing this sort of gung-ho thing. I was trying to be tough. I was trying to be good. And I was thinking, yeah, he'll really miss me. I'm so far away. I'm so far away. But what the amazing thing was, being so far away, I started to experience and understand there is another world. There is so much more out of your own hemisphere. There is so much more 
out of your own perception. There's all these other people. It's, it's like another planet, another world, another universe. Everything is happening so far away from London. And the people, had a, everyone had a great sense of humor. It was very hot and sunny. It was like January, wasn't it? And I started to get happier and happier and better and better as I stayed here. And I came here for 10 days and I stayed two months. <laughs> And I fell in love with Sydney. And I was staying down at Woolloomooloo, and I would walk up the hill every day to come and have brunch or lunch or something with Wayne or Natasha or whatever. And, and it was like a few people that I really got on well with here at the museum. And it was strange. I would then sometimes walk the other way and I'd go up to King's Cross to do my dry cleaning or go to the bookshop or whatever it was. And you'd have all the backpackers standing there next to that sign that says, you know, New York 10,000 miles, London 15,000 or whatever. And they'd always look so forlorn, like so sad with these giant backpacks asking some str And in those days, there weren't, you know, most people didn't have a telephone, especially backpackers. And so they'd be asking some person with an instamatic camera to take a photo of them. And they'd look so forlorn with this giant snail thing, looking so <laughs> unhappy, going, you know, 15,000 miles away. And I think, God, that's depressing. Imagine if you're someone's parents or lover or whatever, and you get this photo. And I was thinking that. I always thought, I'm, I'm never going to be in that situation. I'm, I'm 15,000 miles away, and I'm doing good. And I don't <laughs> want that photo. And the other thing is, if I did have that photo, my photo is going to be a postcard saying, I miss you, I love you, I want you. I'm so far away, I can't wait to see you. I, I think about you, I, you know. It's never going to be look, I'm 10,000 miles away. It's like, what is that about? So when the Sydney Commission came up, the proposal, I thought about when I first came here and how I felt. And I thought I would like to say something which expresses how I feel about being so far away, how I feel about distance and, and movement and love and passion and, and all of those things. And I thought, and I thought about the words, the distance of your heart. How far away is a heart? And then I thought about the times I've been in love with someone, like especially the boyfriend that I'm talking about, and you're laying in the same bed. They're this close, but a thousand miles away from you, you know? And everybody in this room, nearly everyone, anyone who hasn't experienced this is very lucky, but nearly everyone has experienced being close to someone they love, and they're a million miles away whatever it is, you've had an argument, a fight, you don't relate, you don't want to touch each other anymore, you hate each other, or whatever. So the distance of your heart isn't just about literal distance, it's also about how you're feeling right now at the moment. So all of the, so my project that I'm doing here in Sydney is called The Distance of Your Heart. And it's lots of little birds, and they're all the way down Bridge Street, like a kind of highway of spiritual little birds that take you from one part of Sydney to the other. And, um, yeah, that's what I'm doing here. <laughs> I'm really enjoying this interview. It's, 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 it's as easy to do. I, I think... <laughs> One question, a good answer. I, when Tracy came in 2003 too, it was such a, it was a wonderful moment because we actually, we did our smallest ever blockbuster. So we had the most enormous audiences for the show, which Tony Bond and myself and Tash had cooked up, which actually occupied one room in the contemporary galleries. But it, it, the, the response to it, I thought was extraordinary. And I'm so glad to hear that you felt so welcomed. By it. I would like to point out as well, with all those brunches and lunches, Michael Brand, I had a very busy work schedule. I was still doing in the evening, so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think to hear about this work, I mean, the bronze birds, they, they, it is an incredibly moving piece. I mean, it's unmonumental, but it occupies your heart and your mind when you see it. I saw it for the first time today. And they, they literally alight on buildings, on columns, they're under seats. And the little bronze birds, which are so realistic uh, and so enticing that you think they're actually there and they're real until you get closer. Um, how did you actually, it's really interesting because your practice can be so visceral and so tough and so sort of um, really open and honest and harsh, but this has this great gentleness to it as well. Did you really deliberately want to put something gentle out there for the public and lead them in that way? No, I, I, didn't, I didn't do it. I'm not patronising Sydney, 
thinking you need something soft and gentle and palatable and I want to get this commission. I love birds. I love them. So I want to give you something that I love. It's a public commission. Why would I, why would, why would I give you something that I don't want to see every day? In, people always ask me if I have my own art in my house. And I have, not in my home in London, but in France I have tiny works or something. But in my house in London, I only have pictures of animals. And some of them are Victoria. I have a Victorian dog with a pipe, which would look very good in here, actually. <laughs> a, a, a Victorian dog with a pipe in his mouth. I have some very beautiful birds. I have some kitten drawings. I have this and that. Because when I wake up in the morning, I want to feel good. Uh, you know, on my, on my social media things that I look at, I, I, everyone says I'm a pervert because I've just only got like cute animal or, you know, animals are us or whatever. You know, I like looking at kittens and, and, and puppies and cute things and birds and, and little baby foxes and everything. I want something which makes me feel better and remove me from my everyday experience. And I really seriously think that a lot of public art makes people feel worse rather than better. So I, that's what I really believe. I think every, and, and a lot of artists are going to kill me for saying this. But it's true. When we walk down the street, we don't want to be bombarded with something painful. We just want to carry on walking. But what would be really good if we carried on walking and stopped for two seconds, felt good, had a good positive thought. And when I see birds flying in the sky, or if one just landed here, it makes me feel good. Or we were watching birds yesterday from here, from the, um, from the restaurant, and they were all landing on top of the um, umbrellas and canopies and everything, and there was your miners and your this and your that. and all, uh, What birds were there, Harry? Parakeet. I mean, we saw about five or six different kinds of birds. It was amazing. And some were funny, some were beautiful, some were poetic. But each one gave us a different feeling or a different emotion. When you walk down Bridge Street now and you see one of these little birds, I swear on my life it's going to make you feel different from how you felt before. And that's what art should do. It should make you feel different. It should give you an emotional feeling. It should make your mind change. It's not, an, it's not my ego that I'm putting on you. It's your mind that should have a way of, like, my art should make you think differently from before. I'm giving you a way into something. I'm not trying to make you think or believe something. I'm not trying to bombard you with something. I don't want to be bombastic. And I think a lot of public art is so bombastic, so macho, so, like... You know, it's like, please, just give me the grass back. Let me lay down and sunbathe. You know, a lot of things. It's just like too much. These tiny birds are not too much. One day, I will make... I, I do make these giant bronze sculptures, which I think maybe for a lot of people publicly would be too much, but I'm not showing them publicly. I, I, I think every artist has to be very conscientious and very responsible for what they put in the world. Otherwise, you know, me, my nature, I'm so emotional and so volatile. When I was younger, my art was all about like, uh, you know, throwing it out everywhere, all this kind of thing. And now that I'm older, I've got to be more conscientious about what I have to give, to take, hold, hold for myself. And the birds are easy, so easy for everybody. That's why they are perfect public art. That's why they are a gift to your city. That's why it's not my ego forcing it on your city. I love Sydney. I love it. And after I'm dead, and after we're all dead, those birds will be, still be there, and hopefully they'll still be loved and cherished by other people. That's what I want. I don't want people to dislike what I've given to you, if that makes sense. <laughs> I think it absolutely makes sense and as I said I think it's an incredibly generous work because it allows you to experience and think about your relationship to this place as you say the distance of your heart but also far away places literally and metaphorically um, taking you back to some of the earlier work I just just want to touch on a moment because one thing that struck me seeing it this morning uh, the statue of Sir Thomas Mort one of those big sort of strong colonial men standing there with his hand on a very large column 
on his left, which looked like a little bit of a substitute. And he now has a big colonial Victorian statue, has a little Tracy Emin bird sitting on his shoulder. <laughs> which I just thought was such a wonderful moment. But it took me back to your tougher work in the 90s. Um, and the work which I first saw, which made me want to work with you, was that extraordinary video, Why I Never Became a Dancer, from 1995, in which you, uh, you spoke as an outsider claiming back agency when you basically said, fuck you to the slut shamers of Margate. I mean, it was a really tough work about a difficult teenage years in a particular location where you were not treated well and not treated well by men. It's incredibly empowering. And, and just that connection from that really tough visceral work to this moment now of that bird alighting on the man, it seemed to connect through in this very gentle way. Is that... Well, first of all, I'm going to say that Wayne is so romantic. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not like, you know, whatever it is. What's that... that um... mm -hmm that pirate with the parrot on his shoulder. It's not, it's actually at the foot of his feet. Okay, in my mind, it was on his shoulder. <laughs> Taking a dump on that yeah, shoulder. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think your mind was just on that big column that was in his <laughs> hand, okay? But, um, but yeah. But, it was thrusting, Tracy. Yes. <laughs> but but the, Wayne's point is a lot of, I think what you're also trying to say is a lot of public or sculpture or whatever or things we see are these statues of these men and they're men of power and men of position throughout history. There's very few, very few statues of women in public places or women in history. There's um, very few people of, of any kind of colour or different race of statues or whatever. People are really complaining about this now. They're kind of sick of it and they want things to change. Well, we've changed it in Sydney in a very easy way. We've got a tiny little bird at someone's foot going, you know, it's all right for all of us. We're all here. All of us have been here. We've all got a place. We've all got a position, if that's what you're trying to say. I, there was a much more succinct way of putting it, Tracy. Yeah. Um, but it was just thinking through, I guess, that sort of sense of agency and empowerment and, and making room for other people, which I think your practice has always done from the very personal approach, the fact you've shared your emotions and your own experiences so openly but, but has allowed other people in. Well, the whole thing is, like, say with the birds. So the birds are about migration. So the bir tiny birds don't ever get as... Tiny birds don't, from the north, never get as far as Australia. But there are tiny birds. There have been tiny birds. There's always tiny birds. You know, it's, there's a place for everything in our minds and in our imaginations. And, and what, I'm, what I'm saying is that... Um, you know, exactly what I said about lovers or whatever, or distance of your heart. You know, we can... People came here, I don't know, 200 years ago or whatever, miles away from home, never been able to get back. You know, orphans came here. All these people came to Australia that could never return for whatever reason, had to make this their home. And, and now people are mig having to migrate, having to leave their homes, everything. It's, it's happening, it's always happened. And this is something which is relative, like throughout history, for always. And my little birds represent that on a really big political level, in a very subtle way. But also, they represent how you feel personally as a single individual. So you're saying that it's not hardcore, and my work, you know, back in the 90s was really hardcore and shocking or whatever. It still is. I'm still making work that shocks myself in my studio. I'm still making paintings that I can't believe that I've made, that I have to live with or whatever. I'm still having to deal with subject matters that, that, that scare the life out of me, but not in this context within the public. It's like I could sit here and swear or something, and how far on the radio and swear, how far would that get me? You know, and it's like having the right thing for the right context. Which works beautifully. Um, I think, and it's also interesting to see the trajectory, just um, thinking back through your career as well, and the reason I'm, I'm concentrating that a little bit too is because this magnificent book, which we're also and launching book, tonight, yeah. which covers the last 10 years of Tracy's career, so that's why I'm thinking a little bit further back as well. But I think as a measure of how you've opened, one of the people who've opened up a space for other people in the world, if I think of you in the 1990s, as an outsider, in a sense, in the British art establishment, um, reaching for your own agency and finding your own voice in that moment, 
Um, and in preparing for this talk, just reading through that list of honours in recent years. So to think that you're the, this, only the second woman to have represented UK at the Venice Biennale in 2007. You've been made a Royal Academician. You've got at least three doctorates and PhDs being bestowed. Um, you've become the Royal Academy's Professor of Drawing. And in 2012, the Queen appointed you Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, which is us, the Empire. So. <laughs> <laughs> And shall I, shall I tell you something really funny about being a commander? Because we read all the rules and everything. So, for example, supposing there was a fire right now, you should listen to me. Because <laughs> apparently I have, the, I have this sort of thing that I can command, naturally. Yeah, so. <laughs> Commander Trace, I, I almost <laughs> thought I had to call you Your Highness then, but <laughs> um, I think, and, it, and I'd absolutely not say you're not making gutsy, visceral works laden with emotions, because that's really clear in this book, and it's fascinating seeing your return to a pr painting practice and drawing practice, which were there throughout as well, that whole period. Um, the neon works which continue those enormous large bronzes which take a lot of conceiving and a lot of making. Um, and working on this book, because you work very closely on it, wh how did it feel reviewing your practice? It's not something we often get time to do. So. Okay, so this is a really str I shouldn't say this, but doing a book that's 10 years of your work, afterwards you get into, I don't know if anyone else here has done it, you know, like a monograph for 10 years. Afterwards, you hate everything you do. You hate it. You think you're useless. You think, you look at everything. You think, what have I been doing? I've just wasted the last 10 years, you know. And the whole point of it is a very good benchmark to draw a line. But I felt, I always feel really low. It's like doing a giant exhibition, a giant exhibition where you see everything. You have to go through everything. And I think, is that all I've done? Is that all I've amounted to, this book, in 10 years? And so instead of me getting kind of all conceited and sort of high from it, it does the opposite to me. It makes me feel very low and it makes me feel like I haven't done anything, I haven't achieved anything, I haven't worked hard enough, I've been really lazy. So, um, you know, now I just want to do the next book. So it's kind of quite a healthy thing, really. And, and it's really funny because I look, I look through it and I, I can't believe that... Oh, I don't know. I, I can't really explain it. I, I see big gaps in the work, and I, I see, I see uh, places where I should have continued a certain pathway with my work where I didn't or whatever. So it's good. It's like a kind of message to yourself, but a horrible message, I must say. <laughs> but I the just... book's good. I like, uh, it's a good thing is I like this book more than the other one. Hopefully, when the next one I do in 10 years' time, I'll like more than this one. That would be good. <laughs> Can I just say, Tracy, that um, a book this size is not my idea of 10 years of lazy. <laughs> Seriously. Um, and what I think comes across as um, someone who's not, I've seen some of these works but not all of them, um, is the language that's shared between them. And I think it becomes really clear. I mean, the, the language in your writing, which is a form of drawing but with words, the drawings themselves, which are a form of visual expression through images, through into the paintings, which use both languages and take them into it, there's this wonderful connectivity across, which comes back to your hand, which is connecting into your mind. Is, do you see drawing as being a very key part of the practice? Yeah, but I've, I've always said that drawing, you know, is what I'm looking at, and then it goes into my hand. I'm looking at something, it goes into my hand, and then from my hand it comes up, and then goes through my heart, and then comes back into my, you know, it's all through my body and through my blood and then back through my eyes again. It's like a full circle thing. I love drawing, I love painting, I love touching my art, I love the sculpture, I love, I love using my hands. And, and I think as I get older, you know, the neons are different because the neon is my handwriting and the neon is light. The neon is my name in lights, you know. It makes me feel good every time I see it. And I think, I shouldn't make any more neons. I think, oh, just one more. I can't, I can't help it, yeah. But, um, and, and it's genuine, it's sincere. You know, people, you know, anyone that thinks I make too many neons, you see how much I write a week. I write, a, on average, between six and 10,000 words a week you know, every week normally. I love writing. I don't keep a diary or a journal, but I just write a lot. 
and, you know, and, and from that, I have many, many sentences. I have many things that would be good as neons. But my neon isn't like knocking out another piece of work. It's about why should this neon exist? Where should it be? What purpose does it have in my life? How does it make me feel? Why is it, you know, why is this neon existing? I can't, you know, it isn't just another light or something. Or, and I think... For me, as I get older, it's becoming more and more important that I use my own hands, that I make everything myself. So I don't have any more sewing in my studio. And if I do any sewing again, it will go back to the little really tiny ones. So I'd be sitting here on stage sewing as I'm talking to Wayne. You know, I loved it when I did all my own sewing. And I loved it then when I just had a, like a sewing bee, a circle of friends sewing with me. What I didn't like is when I employed people in my studio to sew for me. It got to, like, I don't know, it, it, they never sewed a stitch that I couldn't sew. That was my expression. I never went off to India and got a gang of women all sewing for me or down Brick Lane and employed loads of women sewing for me. I would never do that, like a lot of artists would, actually. But, I, but now I just really simply only want to make work that I touch, that I feel that is mine. And I think now... With the age that we're living in, with everything being so cyber, so technical and everything, I think that the, the, the touch of the artist is more and more important. And I think galleries and um, museums are more like churches, more like religious places, more like a place where you can feel some kind of soul, some kind of resonance. Like there's the, the what's it, the Clovis, the, oh, yes, the, the brothers. Sons the Sons of Clovis is one of my favourite paintings in the entire universe and every time I stand in front of that painting I want to get on my knees and cry I want to hug that painting I just I just love it you know and I, and I wouldn't love it if it wasn't painted by an artist I wouldn't I don't want to look at some design I don't want to look at some clever idea I want to feel that emotion I want to have my own and the sons of clover it's like fuck was it some mother hanging them up by their hamstrings they're two gay guys that have been sent out you know and punished for being in love and every time I look at that painting that's what I feel when I look at it and I think wow that painting is so strong it's so hardcore it's so amazing and somehow it's so sexy and I feel all these things when I look at it because it was made by an artist someone that was feeling emotion as well and it resonates with me when I look at it I want people to look at my work and feel that they're not going to feel it if I run a fucking factory are they <laughs> you can't yet you can later let Wayne ask me the question. Just with, yeah, with the size of the crowd, we can't do questions, unfortunately. We are actually towards the end of our time. We can um, do questions. We can do a couple. You can? You want to do a couple? Yeah, but you can carry... You've got, an, you've got a beginning, a middle and an end, Wayne, I can tell. Oh, I'm just... <laughs> Tracy, you know me well. Those brunches have paid off. <laughs> it was just really moving towards the book. Um, but we will, Tracy's very happy to take a couple of questions, which is great. So we'll come to you in a moment. But just um, Jonathan Jones' essay on here, I have to say, it's one of those essays you read, I wish I'd written it. Not only that, I wish I could write <laughs> like that. It's the most beautiful poetic essay, but it takes your practice back to the Venus of Willendorf 25,000 years ago. So I think it's a really remarkable um, contribution to the scholarship and writing around your work. Did you work closely with him on that, or did he...? No, it's brilliant, because um, Jonathan Jones is a very, very renowned art historian and, and critic in, in London. He writes for The Guardian, and he actually has been very, very... Um, what's the word? derogatory and kind of quite scathing about my work in the past, like really hardcore, like really heavy against my work. And he wanted to interview me about my bed when it was coming up for sale in Christie's. And I was having to do like 30 interviews with journalists from all over the world or whatever. And I thought I should do prime interviews with journalist from London and I thought I'm not just going to do it with someone I know likes my work and I thought I'm going to give Jonathan this interview and everyone told me not to do it because he disliked my work so much and everything but I did it and afterwards 
Jonathan wrote this review, and it, it went, I was wrong. Jonathan Jones, whatever. <laughs> Jonathan Jones, five stars, you know, whatever. And there was like, on, on the radio, they were going, Jonathan Jones gives Tracy Emin five stars. It was like news, for God's sake, you know. And, and, and Jonathan said, I was wrong. I didn't, um, I, actually, you know, I don't know how, I don't think he was that wrong. That was his opinion from the past. But talking to me, and, and the bed was then 20 years older or whatever, and everything goes full circle. And I'm still here, you know? And I'm not a flash in the pan. I, it's not a hobby I'm not I'm doing. I'm not, I, you know, I'm very sincere and I'm extremely passionate about what I do. And I think the thing about, I, I think the thing is like the zeitgeist of the time. At the moment, we need more passion. We need more heartfelt emotions. We need people to be more open with each other. We need We need less greed, that's for sure, you know. And I'm actually, as Wayne said, I hate to say this, but I'm pretty generous on a lot of levels with things, and I'm quite open about a lot of things. So before, when people looked at my work and they thought it was narcissistic and ego, now, because the times that we're living in, it kind of opens out, and people see that actually, I'm like, you know, I have death threats, you know, people hate me, you know, I'm vilified, you know, only because of my art, and that's kind of unfair. You need people like me to open up and extend feelings, emotions, points of view, everything. You need people to put their head above the parapet to, to make the world go by. And I think the sad thing, the times that we're living in now, more and more people that are good people are afraid to do that. And Jonathan Jones recognised within my work that I'd actually been very honest and laid myself on the line. And he appreciated that and then delved further into my art. And then now, so do you want to hear a good funny story quickly? I so do. Jonathan, Jonathan <laughs> Jones came to France to interview me for this catalogue essay. So, and when he, when he came, um, the first thing, he, 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 we flew, I, I mean, I didn't, didn't know him. And we met at the airport and we're sitting on the plane together, you know, for two hours. Then we get off the plane and we go into my house and we get in the car and we get out the car, and then he said, where do you live? And I said, oh, it's, a, it's only going to be 15 minutes, and we get in a helicopter, and he's absolutely afraid of helicopters and flying and scared of heights. So the first thing I do with this critic that's completely slagged my work off is put him in a helicopter. <laughs> 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 and then the next, and it's and this flight to my house is really, really amazing. And he and he and he just really loves everything about art history to do with the south of France, you know, to do with you know everything. So he's absolutely amazed as we're flying over, this, and he's not afraid at all. And he starts to fall in love with what he's looking down on, as opposed to being afraid of it. We get to my house, and then the next day we go swimming. And he's an okay swimmer, but we're swimming out, and I live in this bay. And as we're swimming out, he said, where are we swimming to? And I'm going, just there, just there, just there. And he says, how far are we swimming? And I said, and as I swim away from him, he says, where are we swimming to? And I said, remember those reviews? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, he just say, yeah, we get on really well. And he's like, he's, he's pretty much a genius. He's got a brilliant sense of humour yeah. and he's wrote the most fantastic. And he doesn't, yeah. you know, I know now if I do a show and he doesn't like it, we'll talk about it and we'll talk why and I'm going to learn something and we're going to talk about, because, because I trust him, you know, it's gone full circle. So. No, that's fantastic. Um, Tracy, I don't have any more questions. Um, that was the most wonderful answer. I, in the essay, which I have read, there's my red tabs, I can prove it. Um, <laughs> Jonathan mentions, it's quite wonderful, he says, I arrived unexpectedly by helicopter in France. <laughs> <laughs> it's that one little scene, and so I'm really glad to have that backstory. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's great, Tracy is prepared to take a couple of questions. So we've got a question over here. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. So the question was about ego and, and Tracy's answered it already. So we've done that. Are, are there a couple of other questions or we can move into the book signing over here? Um, my colleagues here are wondering if you have a tattoo. Do, you Do have I have a tattoo? Yeah. Okay, yeah. 
Are you tattoo enthusiasts? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you are. It's my tattoo. It's an anchor. It signifies, little did I know at the age of 19, it signifies Christianity, the sea, man, divinity, spirituality, uh, the sea, the land, different, the, the, you know, it's, it signifies different, I know, the sea, the land. And home. Home, <laughs> no, whatever, it's an anchor, whatever. <laughs> She grew up in Margate, there was the sea. <laughs> yeah, it's the sea, I love the sea, yeah. But what a twit I was, because when I had this, when I had this done, um, the tattooist didn't want to do it on me, and first of all, he drew it here, and I said, no, I want it up here, and he drew this very thin line, and he did it almost like a biro drawing, and I said to him, oh no, it's not thick enough. And he said to me at the time, you're very pretty, I don't feel comfortable doing this. And I said to him, do it again. <laughs> and I made him go over the top, which is quite painful actually. And now I have this very thick sort of like prison kind of tattoo. And, <laughs> and I always think it would be so cool now if I just listened to him and had this thin biro line. And people would go like that and it just never comes off. So. Fantastic, we'll have another question. Um... Uh, there's one over here. I can see you. Speak loudly. Um, what advice do you have for young female artists? Uh, uh, artists? First of all, don't consider yourself female. Consider yourself as an artist, number one. <laughs> Secondly, if you're a student or if you need money, get a job doing something that you like. So if you like shoes, get a job in a shoe shop at the weekend. If you like books, get a job in a bookshop. If you like food, get, try to get a job in a really good restaurant, waitressing or in the kitchen or whatever. Try to apply yourself to what you like, not to what you don't like. That's an important thing. And the other thing is, um, my new motto is, um, um, I didn't, no this, is, no, this is good. I said, no, my friend Troy, who's covered in tattoos, who said he might actually tattoo this on himself. I said, um, you know, I, I, don't, I, I, don't ex I don't expect anything for nothing, but I'm happy to work for everything. I work for everything. I work for everything in my life. And if anyone expects any shortcuts or anything for free, it's not going to happen. It really isn't. So I would say to any young artist, don't expect to break. You just keep working hard. You just keep working and keep... And also, don't expect anyone else to believe in what you're doing if you don't believe in what you do. That's the most important thing. That is just a perfect answer. Um, we will wind up now. I did want to um, also just, uh, which I meant to do earlier, thank Barbara Flynn, who worked on the City of Sydney projects as curator, and Harry Weller, who's Tracy's assistant, who's actually been on his hands and knees sticking those birds <laughs> on those bits of sandstone <laughs> around Sydney as well. So they've made a really important contribution to this project and having yes. Tracy here. <laughs>